Think of the bones and the tips of the fingers and the thumbs. Where are they right now? Try to locate them in your awareness, and then notice if there's any tension around them. If there is, relax it. Breathe calmly. And then move up to the second joints. Do the same thing. Locate them in your awareness right now, and look to see if there's any tension. Hold in mind an image of those joints, the bones there. And then move up to the third joints. Same process. Then to the bones of the palms of the hands. Work your way gradually up the arms like this, bit by bit by bit, whatever you know about the bones. Up to the shoulders and the shoulder blades. Then start with the toes. Work up the toes, the feet, the ankles. Gradually going up the body, up through the spine. Try to separate the vertebrae as much as you can. One vertebra at a time. Up through the back, the neck, and then to the skull. Then expand your awareness to fill the whole body, so you're with the whole skeleton. That same sense of relaxation around all the bones. And then just hold that image in mind. And then if you want, you can expand it to other organs in the body. You go through all the different organs in the, in the abdomen, the liver, stomach, small intestines, large intestines, pancreas, spleens, kidneys. Have a sense of where they are. Visualize them. And then wherever they are in the body, think of relaxing that spot. The purpose of this is to get you used to thinking about the organs in the body and be relaxed about it at the same time. Because this can be a topic of tranquility. You think about all the issues in life and how so many of them come around being worried about the body. And then you can ask yourself, what's there to get worried about? It's just a bunch of organs. And if you take the body on its own terms, it's not much. But we don't take it on its own terms. We have uses for it. We have plans for it. After all, it's through the body that we can experience whatever sensual pleasures the world has to offer. And this is a large part of our attachment to the body. Apart from lust, it's simply that lust for a body itself. There are all the other things that we can access in the world through the body. And if the body malfunctions, it cuts off our access. This contemplation helps you see that. Our attachment to the body is not to the body in and of itself. It's to the associations we have with it. So if you're going to cut off your attachment, it has to go beyond the body itself. To thinking about all those sensual pleasures out there. How much are they worth? Think of all the images the Buddha gives to describe sensuality. It's a bead of honey on a blade of a knife, 
borrowed goods, a chain of bones that thrown to a dog, and there's nothing left on the bones. But it's going to sit there and chew and chew and chew on the bones. That's the mind's relationship to sensuality. It keeps chewing, chewing, chewing on sensual thoughts, but doesn't get any substance out of it, any real nourishment. As John Lee says, all of its flavor is in the saliva. In other words, it's what you put into it. And is it worth putting into it? The purpose of all these contemplations is to think about the allure of these things that we're attached to, and to think about the drawbacks of the attachment. Now they work only if you're convinced there's something better. Otherwise you say, well, you have to, get it. You have to take the bad with the good, otherwise you don't get the good. But what if there's something better that we close off by going after what we think is good? This is the kind of contemplation you have to do every day, to locate where the location of your craving is. There's an interesting passage in the canon where the Buddha says, things that you've never seen. Is there any craving there? And he says, no. And your first response might be, well, there are a lot of things I haven't seen that I, have, that I would really like to see. But stop and think. Your craving is not in the seeing of those things. The craving is located in your mental image of what those things are like. So engage in these practices that go against the grain to see where the craving is. Because if you can't locate it properly, you really can't deal with it. And you can think about how much our mislocated craving creates trouble for us. I mean, personal relationships. You might think you want the other person. Usually you want an image of the other person, and then you're upset when the person doesn't fit in with the image. The same principle applies to a lot of things both outside and in. And so we do these practices to locate exactly where those cravings are found. And sometimes the question arises, how many times do we have to do this before it sinks in, before it really hits home? And John Mahabo has the comment, he says, don't count. The effect of this kind of contemplation takes a while to seep in. And you can't determine ahead of time, so it's going to be 30 times or 100 times or 200 times. You just keep doing it again and again. Think about how many times you've looked in the mirror. How many times was enough? We keep on looking, looking, looking to see something attractive there. So now you've got to change that habit, because that habit is so deeply ingrained. It's going to take a while. When you look in the mirror, learn to look for the wrinkles, not out of fear. Be avid to look for the wrinkles and the other signs of aging. Remind yourself, you wanted a body, this is what you've got. It provides you access to the human world, but at a price. Is the price worth it? And again, if you don't see that there are any alternatives, you say, sure, yeah, what else? What else can I want? But the Buddha says there are alternatives. We create a sense of who we are, partly out of the body, partly out of our thoughts. Our perceptions, our feelings. And then we construct an identity around it. And then we're exposed to anything that would challenge that identity. 
And the Buddha is basically saying, we have the choice. There are other things we could identify with. Here's an interesting passage where Mahanama comes to see the Buddha. Mahanama is a, one of the Buddha's cousins, one of the few who didn't ordain. And the tradition has it that he was a stream winner. And the Buddha was going to leave the place where Mahanama was. It was the end of the rains retreat. He was going to go off wandering. Mahanama says, what if somebody, a wise follower of the Buddha, is passing away? How do I counsel them? And the Buddha first says, reassure them that they are a wise follower. They have a good basis for going on to a good destination. Then ask them if they have any worries about their family, or about the pleasures they're going to leave behind. Say, so if you're concerned about human pe sensual pleasures, actually there are better sensual pleasures up in the heavens of the four great kings. Set your mind there. And then when the person has set his mind there, even better sensual pleasures among the devas of the thirty-three. He works up through the heavens. Finally gets him to the level of the Brahma heavens. And says, well, even there there's self-identity. It would be good if you could set your mind apart from self-identity. And if the person can, the Buddha says, that person's release is equal to the release of anybody who's gained full release. So it is possible work your way up, using sensuality to pull you out of your attachment here, to this body and this world. And then to remind you that no matter how good it gets, as long as there's an identity in the world, there's going to be an identity view of who you are and what you're attached to. It's going to tie you down. So you work on the body first as a gross level of attachment, but then we have to work in. Because after all, the body is not the problem. It's our desires around it, and our desires are based on perceptions. And you have to see what motivates the perceptions that say the body is worth holding on to. Whether we see it as worth holding on to because it's attractive or because it's useful for other purposes, we want to make sure at the very least that the purposes you hold on to the body for have to do with the Dharma. And then you have to release the mind from that. So we work our way up. Let's start by being comfortable with seeing the parts of the body, regarding it this way. So it's not such a shock when you have to leave it. It's not such a, such a shock when you realize it's going to fall apart. You realize that it's not such a great tragedy. And that allows you to look at where the attachments are in the mind. Because that's where the real work needs to be done.